basics of uh, what Rod Robinson will contain in the most recent response and senders and also in the email that went out inviting you all to this meeting tonight. Uh, born 1949, three decade plus crew with the Milwaukee Road and near the Sioux Line and who died in 1990 age 50 in a really horrible uh, motorcycle accident. But if uh, in the 1980s, late 70s and 80s, you went to a train show in the Milwaukee area, model railroad show, which it was on almost every weekend. There would be Rod sitting at a table selling boxes of duplicate slides. Some were his pictures, some were taken by people he knew. And um, that's how I got to know Rod. So how do we start the images here? So if you uh, encountered Rod, he'd say, oh, what's your favorite, where, what railroads do you like to rail fan? What's your favorite railroad? What railroad do you model? And I answered all those uh, dictates, told him that the railroad I rail fan most often was the Chicago Northwestern. He said, oh, you're going to want my Northwestern slide set. And I said, well, I actually model the Pennsylvania. And they always, you're going to want my Eastern Electric slide set. Slide set. I said, well, I also, you know, rail fan the Sioux and the Milwaukee Road. He says, I have slide sets for all of them. So I said, well, let's see what you got in the Milwaukee Road side. And he said, well, look at this image. And he just handed me the slide and I held it up to a fluorescent light in the room and uh, said, this is uh, well, th this is the, the last remaining line that the Northwestern had on the passenger line that went through, uh, like, uh, uh, cap near along your Capitol Drive near Estabrook Park while the bike path was also there, which was kind of rare. Um, so he said it was rare to get a shot of, of this line when the bike path was also there. So this is near Estabrook Park. Well, I said, uh, well, that's a slide I'd want regardless of the train um, uh, because of the young lady on the bike. Well, that didn't start my relationship off on the best possible foot with Rod because he said, that's my wife. <clears throat> So, um, but uh, uh, just as a, an example of, of what Rod would include in a set of that kind, there's this Russ Porter shot, uh, which would be taken along Lincoln Memorial Drive when the downtown depot was still in operation. Um, so there's the uh, Russ Porter shot. This one has been reproduced many times of the neon sign at the old Milwaukee, uh, Milwaukee Depot of the Chicago Northwestern. And it's a still photograph, uh, a video would have shown that there were, there were um, it made it look like the wheels were turning. And, and uh, it was really an impressive piece of video art. That's a Russ Porter shot. And uh, two Russ Porter shots, also rare, of the interior of the Chicago and Northwest Street. Well, I was hooked pretty quickly when I saw shots of this room. Then I, I mentioned to him that when I rail fed the Northwestern, I did so where I lived in West Dallas near Belt Junction, which is kind of near um, the Lincoln Avenue uh, exit from the freeway south of the zoo. So, oh, you're going to want my uh, Wisconsin electric set because uh, there's this uh, Martin uh, shot of. Uh, uh, Wisconsin Electric uh, going over the Chicago Northwestern. If, if the freeway was here, it would obscure the shot of the car and the bridge. When I lived there, the bridge for the uh, electrics was long gone, but the concrete abutments were still. You can't see it in this shot, but at the bottom of the picture, you can see the top of a line pole. That's where the line to uh, Madison um, left the main and uh, headed directly west. And all of that was still in place when I lived in West Dallas. This bridge was long gone. Um, whoops. Well, yeah, that's, that is what I wanted to do. So I mentioned uh, that he wanted to sell me his uh, Eastern Electrics uh, set. I'm not going to show the whole set, uh, but I'll show a few. Uh, this is Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This is, I believe, South Amboy, um, New Jersey. I think this is also New Jersey. Um, so Rod had a reputation. 
had a reputation amongst, of course, people who went to slot meets as being a very good salesperson. But on the Milwaukee Road, he was both a hostler and a cab crewman. Um, he was known for, well, uh, doing things his way. For example, in 1977, when the Milwaukee Road uh, took uh, one of its uh, classic electric motors, the F1, built in 1915, returned it as close as they could to the original condition in 1915, painted it in the original paint scheme with the original number, not the renumbering it had received later. Notice that the lettering is CM and St. Paul, not Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, and Pacific, that came later, and then donated it to the, uh, the Transportation Museum up in Duluth, you can see it today. But they, they, the Milwaukee Road did this, and it was Rod, who suggested that it needed to be put on a very safe siding where nothing would hit it or side swing, but then by coincidence, that's where you got the best light in this picture. It would also be Rod who, upon uh, uh, Milwaukee Road's uh, FP45 being on the turntable, uh, probably ran up the rickety staircase that took him up to the 35th Street Viaduct, got his shot, and then ran down the staircase and went back to work. So that was the kind of guy Rod was, and he was known for antics of this sort. I don't have the picture. I'm told it exists. But when they were swapping doors on some SD-709s, uh, they found that uh, the way the engine was lettered, it, they swapped doors with another engine and now said Milwaukee Rod. And whether he was instrumental or that, but he did have his picture taken on the engine. I thought someone I knew had the picture, and they claim they don't. Um, there's another side to Ron, and that is a little plastic which a place called Bayboro, W-E-Y-H, file post 185.14. Rod learned that back in the 19th century when they were building this lot, two track workers were killed on the job site, and since nobody knew who they were, they were simply buried on site with no worker. And uh, uh, Rod, on his own time, uh, the site was pointed out to him that at one time crews would blow the whistle in honor of these guys, and then eventually that practice stopped because nobody knew where the place was. But some old head in a cab told Rod where the place was. He went there. Whoops, we're not getting the correct format. This is going to be a problem down the line. I'm sorry about that. Um, anyway, he built the fence and. Uh -huh. Also erected a small cross. Last time I drove by, the, the fence was in rough shape and the cross was gone. We, we're advancing again, but there are going to be pictures later in vertical format that are going to look sideways. So start exercising your necks now. Um, before we get too much further into all this, a few words about black and white versus color photography. Because what, what uh, Rod mostly sold was color dupes and colors. Kevin Keefe, former editor of Trains Magazine, has written. Back in the transition era from steam to diesel, you know, the, the photographers who shot in black and white did their own black, uh, their own dark room, and, and they had to work and they had a real hope of having their pictures published in this magazine. The guys who were shooting color had no such hope. Trains didn't take color pictures. There were no morning sun books. At most, they could hope to share their pictures uh, with, um, uh, with friends in a small group. It's no Surprise, actually, I suppose that this chapter started in 1950, about the time that uh, color slides and slide projectors became more available. Um, and as a consequence, uh, the people who shot color were maybe regarded as sort of, uh, sort of just snapshot picture takers. And uh, um, in further consequences, a lot of times people didn't bother marking their slides because uh, they'd be the one showing them. They knew where they were. Um, even when they went into slide trading, it was usually with someone who knew what the image was about. And getting the precise date wasn't always very important. So there's a lot of these pictures I'm going to be showing that will lack. I don't know who the photographer is. I don't know when the picture was taken. I can sometimes guess where it's taken. But I don't have actual information. So we take this black and white picture of a semi-streamlined Milwaukee Road steamroller. Probably meant as either protection power for the high author, maybe, maybe the valley flyer up there. But uh, you compare this, which is a company photograph, the rods are down, you know, all the, the engine is well lit, the complete engine is in the, in the frame. 
And this very famous picture uh, by a uh, Czech member, Ross Porter, which is in very nice color. But note that uh, Rust didn't capture the front of the locomotive. It's, it's a flawed picture. But uh, people have been blessing his heart for taking this picture ever since because this slide has the authentic colors of the trucks. Those would be the same colors that were on all the Hiawatha locomotive trucks. You see the drivers painted red, the pilot was painted red. Uh, there's even a bit of the number board that you can see how that was painted in a sort of uh, off gray for the locomotive boiler. The thing that's interesting about this picture by Russ Porter, it was, it was taken in 1937. That's a full five years before the Kodachrome shots of Jack Lano that uh, have gained so much uh, respect and uh, reproduction in, in the last couple of decades. But uh, Russ was out there a full five years earlier getting color that really still holds up beautifully, even though this is clearly a dupe and maybe a, a duplicate of the The other problem with color is not all the color film is really so great. Photochrome, which you just saw before, yes, that's it. a film called Agfachrome was apparently quite vivid when the pictures were newly developed, but they over time quickly turned into mostly just brown. And I think this might be an Agfachrome uh, picture. The shades are brown and red and no color other than brown and red. The subject matter, an interesting Milwaukee Road drovers, um, is certainly interesting enough, but you could not rely on this color as a model railroad. Um, even ectochrome had its issues. When I started shooting color in 1980. I was warned away from ectochrome by older photographers who remembered their own problems with it. I think Kodak solved the ectochrome problem about the time that nobody wanted to shoot slides anymore. But uh, here's another example, clearly not ag for chrome because there is green in the shot. Now this is a, uh, this is a uh, Northwestern uh, pulling a Fairbanks Morse demo unit back to Chicago. We are in St. Francis. Um, and so it's heading south, railroad east, but the color is very disappointing. Now, it may just be that the photographer blew the shot. It may be that the processing was not up to par, but uh, it's, it's disappointing. And there are other examples of this in this show. Uh, here is uh, oh, that shot of the Northwestern, that was an Ed Wilson shot, the Bob Thalen collection. Now, uh, this is an Earl Woolen shot from Larry Superman Commission, a Northwestern, um, an E2 uh, uh, Pacific motive. And again, the color is just kind of washed out, although you can see a 400 colors coach in the consist. It looks fairly good. So, with that apology over the way, we're going to start off by looking at pictures. Rod himself took. And uh, we're going to start with um, uh, the box that he called Views from the Cab. And uh, so here we are. He is in the camp, number 333, meeting number eight at Bosworth. Here he is in the camp, number 332, meeting Bosworth. That's the flyer. He's on eight, and he's meeting number seven in Astico, Wisconsin. I don't think I've ever been to Aston. Okay, I'm going to continue now. I understand there might be some problems. Apologize. Okay, now he's on number eight, uh, meeting number seven at Ridge Junction. He is the. Uh, he's on eight at the east portal of Tunnel City. And he's waiting, and the Chicago Northwestern is waiting to use the tunnel. You might remember the Northwestern's tunnel collapsed, so they had to use the Milwaukee roads. And rightfully so, the Milwaukee Road has for those kids. So uh, in this one, 
He is on the second unit of number seven, West Portal Tunnel City. You'll see, um, you can see the, uh, uh, the portal in the background of the picture. And here he's actually in the tunnel. And I said in my description of this that there would be shots you could not get elsewhere. I can't, we're not, am I being heard? Okay. Um, I said shots you can't get elsewhere. I would not suggest going inside the tunnel, the tunnel city, just to get this shot. But he is on board SD40 2 73, looking at the west portal. And here he is. Uh, on Amtrak 7, two miles north of Hoffman Avenue in St. Paul. Here he is at, on the TOSA patrol uh, at Grand Avenue. This picture was reproduced in Sparks and Cinders, I think, or rather it was reproduced in uh, the invitational e email you may have gotten to this meeting. Uh, he's on the cutoff transfer at Grand Avenue. And he is on Fairbanks Morse uh, switcher number 726, passing Miller Brewery. He's on a switch job that had two FM units at the Muskego Yard. And he is on Fairbanks Morse switcher number 760, that's an H10 44, uh, approaching uh, Glendale Yard. What's significant about number 760 is that it was the first locomotive of any kind that Fairbanks Morse built. And in a, in a rare uh, good uh, uh, turn of events, it's preserved down at the Railroad Museum in, uh, in Union and uh, Illinois Railroad Museum, and it's in full running order and beautifully painted. This is from a box of slides that, uh, that uh, Rod called uh, shops. And basically, pictures taken uh, where he worked. This is a U30C with the shop go to track mobile on the turntable. Uh, the Golf Mobile in Ohio uh, E7 off to the right of the picture uh, was probably uh, Amtrak powered during the uh, rainbow period of uh, early Amtrak. Freshly painted Jeep. This uh, locomotive is marked G20, but um, uh, EMD had a locomotive called a G20. This isn't one of them. Um, Milwaukee Road, when they rebuild a G9, would um, basically call it a, a G20 because it met G20 standards. If you look at the trucks, those are shop trucks. There's no traction motors in them. And it's on the transfer table on a cold and windy day with snow falling uh, at Milwaukee Road shops. Here's a night shot that I suspect Rod took from the 35th Street uh, viaduct. Shots inside the shops under a bluish light that made, I, I've tried hard to correct the colors, but it's a big job. Under more natural daylight. Wheel shop. And of course, all of this is gone. The buildings are gone, most of them. Uh, this load, which is the same photo was featured in uh, Keith Coleman's recent book on uh, open loads on railroads. That's an FP7 cab in the rear end of the locomotive in one gondola and some bits and pieces of a Fairbanks horse in the next gondola. Kind of a morose picture. And it wasn't the entire cab. It was cut in about two thirds through. It was otherwise it'd be too wide to fit in the gondola. Here's a shot Rod took in Green Bay of one of those EMD uh, Baldwin hybrids. Uh, it labeled an AS616M. Uh, this was originally a uh, Missouri, Kansas, Texas locomotive. They actually did the conversion or had EMD to it for it. Uh, what it would involve was getting rid of the Baldwin prime mover and using an EMD prime mover. And for various reasons, they needed uh, the taller EMD long hood. And it had to be a special version because it met the Baldwin cab rather than EMD cab. The, the locomotive was scrapped in 1981. And uh, I believe the uh, Northwestern acquired it in 1974. So that gives you a time frame for the picture. But Rod did not date the picture. Uh, the... Uh, 
the eastern end of the Elko line, uh, this would be uh, Wabasha, pardon me, Winona. C C four twenty fives in Winona with the slug unit in between. And again, undated. And an interesting shot that Rod took at Fond du Lac, uh, EMD, Baldwin EMD combo and a Fairbanks Morse uh, uh, matchup. Uh, so uh, a little bit of everything. The next uh, box of slides is one uh, that also features a great deal of Rod's photography. Uh, this one was called Car Fairies. So we'll start, I've, I've grouped them so that we start with Rod's pictures and then go to the pictures taken by uh, others. So uh, the, the Chessie system, late in the Car Ferry era, did send a Chessie system diesel here to Milwaukee. This is on Jones Island. They could only do work on restricted tracks uh, serving the car ferry itself. They did not do other switch work in Milwaukee. Uh, this is more like the uh, CNO engines that I remember switching the car ferry. Again, these are all Rod Robinson shots. Here he is on actually on the on the Badger. He's up on the Badger on the on the passenger platform watching the loading of the Badger. And this, I believe, is a Kermit Bast photo. Kermit was a friend of Rod's, someone I also knew. Um, and uh, here is loading the Badger uh, in a photo taken by Kermit Bast. Notice the uh, three idler flat cars since they didn't want the locomotive actually on the boat itself for uh, balance purposes. And notice it's also a slightly different paint scheme than the uh, switcher we saw earlier. By contrast, here's a Russ Porter shot, also unfortunately undated, uh, loading the Spartan, the sister ship, the Badger. Um, that looks like a 1963 Buick Electra off to the left and, uh, and a uh, 64, and then uh, 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 the old fashioned Volkswagen Bug and a mid 1960s miniskirt next to the bug, so I would put this shot in the, in the middle 1960s. Here are two uh, Kermit Bast shots, uh, and he didn't specify whether it was Badger or Spartan, but showing the unloading, or after it's been unloaded. So if you've ever wanted to know what the inside of Badger or Spartan looked like once all the uh, freight cars were removed, well, this is the shot. This is an old and undated photograph, um, which uh, uh, Rod, uh, his notes said that this was the old Grand Trunk uh, loading dock, which was near the Solvay Coke Company, the old Grand Trunk loading dock. It's, uh, it's not a dated picture, unfortunately. Um, and once again, everything is in so many shades of red and brown that this might have been an egg for chrome photo. Here we see a Russ Porter shot of the Grand Trunk car ferry, uh, the Madison. And for those who remember this, and amazingly enough, uh, in a fairly recent times, the Grand Trunk locomotive they used at their car ferry dock it was a 1927 Brill. It wasn't right out of a catalog. It was a one-off, a one-of-a-kind, and they used that locomotive for decades. It had an old, its own little engine house, which you can see in the background of the picture. Um, so this is a Russ Porter shot, as is this one. Uh, but if you look at the two shots, the lettering is a little, note how big the 73 is on that picture. Notice how small the 73 is on this one. So I think this is a much earlier shot of the Brill by Rustport. They weren't two shots in the same trip. And here's number 73, that 1927 Brill, um, unloading the Grand Trunk uh, car ferry, the Grand Rapids. Again, with idler flats to keep the locomotive off the car ferry. Here's a Kermit Bast shot 
uh, a much more recent shot because the home bridge is in the, in the, in the picture showing the Grand Trunks city of Milwaukee coming into the harbor. And here is Kermit's shot of the city of Milwaukee having turned around and backing up to its dock, uh, about to uh, dock and unload. So that's really about all I have for pictures taken by Rod Robinson. Uh, and of course, some of those were not Rod's pictures, but I wanted to keep them all in, a, in together. Now we're going to move on to Milwaukee Road Shots. And this might be an NRHS excursion, in which case I would date it to possibly uh, late 1950s. We are in Oshkosh, but long after the Milwaukee Road stopped having a passenger depot in Oshkosh. Uh, it's a, it's a, a short train. Uh, uh, the Oshkosh uh, entry into uh, the Milwaukee Road's entry into Oshkosh was kind of a, on an obscure southwestern corner of the city. Um, you, if some of you here may have been uh, uh, to the NRHS meeting years ago, when Brian Siegel gave a very thorough talk about the uh, Milwaukee Road's entry into Oshkosh. But uh, here are the uh, happy passengers on what is obviously a rainy day I've unloaded at Oshkosh. While there is a depot in the picture. It's a freight house. There is no passenger depot. So I think that is an NRHS uh, uh, outing, and hopefully uh, our similar outing uh, at East Troy won't be uh, affected by rain. Still rare shots of the freight house in Oshkosh. It's recent enough that the Jeep is painted in UP colors. So that's why I dated it to later part of the 50s or maybe early 60s, but there was no date on the pictures. And the, um, uh, in my notes here. Oh, all these pictures were taken by Owen Leander, whose uh, photography shows up often in uh, Rod's sets. Here, for example, is an Owen Leander shot, from, but rather from his collection, I should say. It's also in Oshkosh. It's at Milwaukee Road 060, so it's, yes. A question has been asked. Yeah, I wonder why there is a station sign on the freight house. Now we are showing it. Because there's no passengers who should be informed where they are at. Well, for one thing, you might have crewmen who are unfamiliar with the territory, and uh, it would be helpful to them know if they've arrived in, Osh in Oshkosh. <clears throat> and also, you would have presumably freight customers who would want to know that this is the Milwaukee Road Freight House. People with their trucks. But thanks uh, for the question. If they are in Oshkosh, they are in Oshkosh. They know so they're in have... Oshkosh, but they don't know they're at the Milwaukee Road Freight House. And yeah, but the truckers wouldn't necessarily know either. I mean, they might be coming up from uh, from uh, Appleton or uh, Green Bay, Amaro. Okay, I think it makes only sense for someone on the train, not on the on the streets. The I I think it's very common for uh, freight houses in this country to be labeled by okay. both the name of the railroad and the name of the city. I've I've seen that. Okay. Don't forget though the. Station sign is an official point on the railroad, and that would have been the official Oshkosh location in the timetable. Okay. Hence the sign. Yep, and also uh, for the time books and payment to the uh, crews. So, so there's only one uh, one station sign there, the freight there and the passenger signs on both sides of the station. No, uh, I mean, uh, if, if there's an additional passenger station, then there's also an Oshkosh sign. Or wasn't there any? Uh, I don't know. Because it, 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 it does make sense if there's only one single point that is named by, Oshkosh. By the time these pictures were taken, that was a freight station. It may have been the passenger station when built. I don't know. It had, it had that look to it. It was certainly a nice building. Oh, well, that makes sense. Yes. We're back in Milwaukee now. We're at the Milwaukee Road Hump Yard, and we're looking east. Um, based on the freight cars in the yard and based on the fact that the manufactured gas facility can be seen off to the far left, I would date this to the 1950s. 
now a side view um, showing uh, to the side of those manufactured gas tanks, um, which are on the other side of the river, actually. If you look at the freight cars in this photo, right dead in the center, there's a Bangor or Rustock, State of Maine, either a boxcar or a reefer. And you can see an ice platform uh, closest to the photographer. I have a name of a photographer for this. No, nope, it appears not. No, no name of a photographer. Um, again, a look at the manufactured gas facilities. Now, but uh, still serviced by steam. Uh, so I would place this at uh, 1954, perhaps 1955. There's a lot of dead steam in this photo. This is the uh, coaling and sanding facility near the shops. Um, and a lot of tenders uh, where the locomotives have been sent off for scrap and the tenders will eventually be sent off. But if you look at the coaling tipple, there are gondolas and hoppers filled with coal. So does that mean there's still uh, steam locomotives using the facility? Maybe, but I think it's uh, also possible they were unloading the coal from the tipple to get rid of it preparatory to tearing the tipple down. If you look beyond the tipple, in the upper portion of the picture, just to the tipple's left, a Sioux line uh, Jeep can be seen because the Sioux line had access to the Milwaukee Road Yard via the connection at Rug Rugby Junction. <clears throat> so exactly the same scene, same locomotive, same uh, gondolas and, and uh, loaded hopper cars under the coal tipple, but radically different color to the photo. Uh, that's the way they looked. But uh, so we are looking east, again, probably from 35th Street uh, at the Milwaukee Road shops, their engine house, I should say, to our right. And then the two sanding towers and the old coal tipple, which I think is being emptied of its coal. This is from the Owen Leander collection, and that's an I-5A-060 in front of the coal tipple during uh, the only happier days for steam locomotives. Fairbanks Moore Sea Liner, consolidation line. Uh, uh, I do not have a name of a photographer or a date for this image. This same photograph appeared in my Do You Know column in the most recent Sparks and Cinders uh, rec trains. So that's uh, the shops and the diesel house and uh, the, the Milwaukee Roads rec train all ready to go, just uh, waiting for the call. And uh, I believe, nope, once again, an uncredited photo. April 1955, <laughs> or the collection of Russ Porter, 484s, uh, which are not going to be running revenue miles again. Uh, so here's the reflection of a, uh, perhaps an F unit in the tender of a Milwaukee Road S3. And you think to yourself, how sad uh, that locomotive is, uh, is uh, about to be turned into razor blades. Well, good news, that's uh, number 265 which ended up being on display on Milwaukee's south side in Bayview for many years and is now uh, safely preserved at the Illinois River Museum in, in Illinois. Two Milwaukee Road uh, Mikados. Um, oh, by the way, I, that prior picture, um, Rod called it Russ Porter Collection, but I, I have seen this picture published and definitely credited to Russ. Two uh, Milwaukee Road Mikados. Uh, the one to the right is, I believe, an L3. That was a very heavy Mikado. The one to the left, I think, is an L2, a more lightweight Mikado. And uh, that is an Earl Rulin photo. In the Larry Suka collection, and uh, uh, the only date that Rod had for it was that Earl took those photos in the 1940s. A double header, a uh, 282, and what I think to be an S2484, 
um, <clears throat> heading west, you can see the um, interurban or uh, rapid transit uh, uh, overhead uh, electric power lines uh, up above the hill. This is again 1940s from the Earl Ruland uh, pictures in the Larry Sukup collection. And uh, just down the tracks, it looks like Earl just took a brief stroll and got the afternoon Hiawatha. Uh, and this one is labeled as being at the old Merrill Park Station site. Notice the brick building in the background, uh, just above the uh, top of the uh, 464 locomotive. That uh, same building shows up much more clearly in this picture, and it's our old friend, FM 760, uh, the first ever uh, Fairbanks Morse locomotive, the one that's been preserved. Unfortunately, an undated and uncredited picture. So now we are looking west. We're looking at the Milwaukee Road shops and yards road. Uh, there are <clears throat> uh, no diesels to be seen that are in Union Pacific uh, colors. So I'm assuming this is prior to 1955 or 56. Maybe as early as uh, the very early 1950s, but there's no steam to be seen and and uh, no uh, steam waiting to be scrapped. So I, I'd be prepared to put this one at 1955. Closer to the depot, the Baggage Express and Coach Yard, which is uh, to the west of the depot. Uh, you see a mix of UP colors and the old Milwaukee Road colors. So I would guess this to be the late 1950s. Uh, notice the stone uh, uh, retaining wall on the other side of the tracks. Now we're standing at that stone retaining wall. You get a feel for the tracks leading behind the photographer would be the tracks going to the depot. Uh, and again, no photographer that I can name for you. So you're on 6th Street. These are those same tracks. Uh, FM diesel uh, uh, helping to uh, make up a train. Uh, notice that the Railway Express uh, car, uh, the second boxed car like car in the consist, is obviously a former troop sleeper with the uh, plated over windows. Now, a very exciting sequence of photographs. Maybe I'm the only one in the room that gets excited by this, but uh, I, if you look at the brick building, there's a black sedan parked uh, to the right part of the picture, kind of right below the, the uh, old brick tower of the Milwaukee Road Depot. And you can see what I assume to be an F7 class 464 on the turntable. And the train that is arriving with the sky top is, uh, give me a moment on this. Well, it's an eastbound arrival. These are Earl Ruland shots from the Larry Sukup collection and were dated from the 1940s on the box. But now we're gonna see a whole sequence of trains. This is why this is one of the most popular rail fanning spots in Milwaukee. That um, F6 uh, uh, Hudson is now on its train. The Chippewa, uh, pardon me, the Olympian Hiawatha with the specially trimmed out Erie built is on the left. And now it's, uh, now the F6 is uh, taking its train out. That black sedan is still in the picture. And you get a nice view of the old, uh, very elaborate ca castle-like tower on the Milwaukee Road Depot, which, as many of you might remember, was torn down, not because it was uh, unsafe, but because people thought it gave Milwaukee an old-fashioned, dowdy image. Yeah. And here's the grand finale of this sequence with two streamlined, four, six, four, and an unstreamlined. Quite a shot. 
This is a not part of that sequence. Uh, this is a July 1951 shot by Russ Porter showing the uh, arrival of the eastbound Olympian Hiawatha. And this, I think, was taken probably near to what we regard, we used to call the new depot, uh, which is now the old depot because they revised the, the old depot to look like a new depot. Uh, but uh, the concrete uh, platform is obviously brand spanking new and uh, the consist still looks pretty nice. But uh, uh, this shot is undated, but I would think uh, middle to late 1960s. Now let's go to the east side of the depot. 1954 Owen Leander collection. Maybe this is 54. Uh, Owen Leander. Yeah, I think this is. This picture was taken by Bob Fergie, a familiar name to uh, people who uh, go to uh, some Bob uh, Baker's uh, slideshows. And did Bob. Yes, this is uh, December of 1964. It's May of 1964. Uh, and uh, this is a rust border shot showing Fairbanks Morse Switcher 733 and some sort of Montana celebration train complete with man in cowboy hat lead, leaving the uh, two-tone gray Pullman. March 1954, Ross Porter shot showing the eastbound Olympian Hiawatha with the public service building in the background. And a really interesting shot when you're one of the original Hiawatha 442s, Class A's, uh, running west into the depot uh, on a curve in the track that's still there, uh, but goes obviously to a different location. A little oversaturated in color, and I tried to do something about that, but I didn't want to kill it entirely because it's a very dramatic shot. These were the locomotives that uh, uh, given a schedule called for consistent 100 mile an hour running, and it was supposedly said that no engineer had the guts to pull the model all the way back. Now, some shots inside of the roundhouse. Uh, if you'll give me a moment to uh, advance my notes. These are Russ Porter shots from uh, 1952. July of 1951. Uh, with a Russ Porter shot that has been reproduced in, uh, in a number of books. This is an interesting shot, not a particularly marvelous photograph, I'm sorry to say, um, but it's an FT diesel, number 37D, heading west. It's going past Solvay Coke. And it's a 1940s shot taken by Earl Rulin from the Larry Sukup collection. So the end of that train is kind of Maple Street, popular rail fanning spot today, but the Solvay Coke Company is, uh, is no more. Now we're on the uh, south side of town. Lake, actually, we're on the College Avenue overpass at Lake with a uh, Two doing some local switching. The picture was taken uh, in 1954 by Russ Porter. And Russ waited until the switcher got into the little yard there, and uh, there's an eastbound passenger train which is unidentified on the slide. That doesn't mean they were successful. I'm sorry for those of you who were listening by a Zoom, one of our people in the room said that he was unaware that there had been an orchard there uh, in Milwaukee. Well, it was certainly all farmland. I mean, even when I was a kid, and again, that goes back uh, several decades, I, I can remember farming in this general area. And uh, uh, 
probably uh, uh, you, you've got to be close to water in order to successfully run an orchard. You've got to have a certain uh, kind of uh, climate. The other side of the lake over in Michigan is obviously better suited for it because that's where the winds are coming from. But you can grow some um, apples and cherries, pears on this side. Anyway, that's lake. And again, I said uh, that's in 1950. So we are in Caledonia, Wisconsin. It's May of 1951, and Russ Porter has happened upon an interesting situation. Uh, class A 442 number one is sitting there and apparently the low water alarm went off and in a panic, the crew dumped the fire and they are standing in front of the locomotive. Why are they standing in front of the locomotive? Well, you're about to see why. They need to figure out how to open up the uh, opening uh, doorway to get out to put down the coupler and probably none of them have ever had to do that with this locomotive. That would be something the hostlers and shop crews would know how to do, but not a road crew. So you've got the conductor looking, and you've got two crewmen looking, and you've got two supervisors looking, and one guy is looking up, and he's noticing there's absolutely no smoke coming out of the locomotive because they don't fire. But they successfully uh, apparently got the door open, lowered the coupler so that a relief engine could pull this poor train up into Milwaukee. Uh, but, you know, talk about a lucky find to be trackside you know, uh, an engine and a train that come to a full stop because of the low water alarm going off. Now we are in Franksville. Uh, an uncredited, an undated picture, uh, but quite a lineup of, uh, of uh, power on that train. And the New York Central boxcar is a rebuilt former USRA boxcar. So boxcar fans have something to look at, too. Uh, not a particularly great picture, but this is the fast mail, which not many people were able to photograph because it ran at night. It was May 1951, and it's a Rust Porter shot at Sturdivant. Back at Sturdivant, this would appear to be the Olympian Hiawatha. Uh, it is uh, not deep. This, this is a, a West Mountain. So we've gone about as far south as we're going to go. Let's go the other direction from the depot. We're at Grand Avenue, just in time to see where another of the high office heading around the event, heading for a Let's see. And here we are at Wauwatosa. Undated, unfortunately. It appears to be the cannonball. Uh, it's the locomotive and two cars. The, uh, the only commuter train Milwaukee really had. Clearly a picture taken in the afternoon, possibly cannibal. Now, this is a very mediocre picture, but it's interesting to me. The photographer is standing on the Chicago Northwestern tracks near Potter Road, and we're looking down at the Milwaukee Road near Watertown Plank Road. And what we're seeing in this picture is the siding that came off the Milwaukee Road, which people have told me either serviced a factory that existed only during two or actually continued all the way up. It was an interchange that someone in the government may have wanted during World War II, but it was removed soon. Still there in this picture, which, let's see, uh, undated and uncredited picture. Here's the afternoon Hiawatha uh, at Brookfield. That depot exists, but has been moved. This is a January 1971 shot by Robert Porter, not Russ Porter, but Robert Porter. Notice that the uh, train order boards have been taken down from the depot. We are in Elm Grove, it's July of 1953, and this is from the Owen Leander picture uh, collection. We are in, I heard O'Connell Walk, he said, yes, this is O'Connell Walk, undated, uncredited, but I think once again, this is probably the cannonball. I only see two cards. Yes, it's O'Connell Walk. 
Um, this is a picture taken in Madison on the causeway. And give me a moment to look at my notes. Uh, this is also from the Owen Leander collection. Note the locomotive, number 171. Note that no smoke is coming out of the locomotive. And note that it looks like people are getting off the coaches in the middle of the causeway. I think this is an NRHS excursion. And uh, uh, we'll, I'll explain more later as we go through the sequence. Here we are arriving in Janesville. I think it's the same train. It's also from the Owen Leander collection. And uh, uh, so it's Janesville. Uh, let's see. May 23rd, 1954. Well, this one is Russ Porter, his collection. But he, Russ Porter may have had a picture taken by Owen Leander. Who knows? Um, but here are happy rail fans with cameras getting off the train or wandering around the train in Janesville with locomotive 171 on the point, which I understand it can be unrelated trains. But this is a rust border shot. Now we're in Janesville, but this is not an NRHS outing. I believe this is a Kambach publishing outing. Uh, in the lower right corner of the picture, I believe the person that is back to us wearing the dark green sh shirt and about to take a photograph is Lynn Westcott, uh, who at this time would have been on the staff of Trains Magazine and Model Railroad Magazine. Not, he was not yet the editor of Model Railroad. I believe next to Lynn Westcott's right shoulder, dressed in a rather light colored suit, is David P. Morgan. I have no idea who the guys in the fedoras are, but those seem to be official rail fan uniforms back in the time. And uh, I do recall that the entire Kambach group would uh, go on various outings from time to time that would be written up either in trains or in Model Railroad or in their other magazine called Model Trains. But the, basically the whole office would go uh, exploring and taking pictures together. This is James Bell. And do I have a date for this? Uh, no, I do not. Or is it correct? This is a picture. This is a neat shot in May of 1950. We're in Janesville still. Uh, the nice looking train to the right, that's the varsity heading towards Madison. The uh, interesting but older looking train to the left is the Mineral Point Local. May 1950, Rust Border. Will give me a moment. I need to once again advance my notes. So, since I mentioned Mineral Point, let's go to Mineral Point. Here we are at Mineral Point in, in another famous uh, Russ Porter shot. Uh, uh, Rod's slide said Russ Porter or collection, but I have seen this picture credited to Russ. Then again, maybe that's correct. Uh, 1954, that depot is from the 1850s, it still exists, it's been refurbished, but there's no tracks, there's no trains going to Mineral Point anymore. Uh, kind of an outlier in uh, Rod's collections, this is Colmar, Iowa, with the doodle bug, and what looks like a home-built trailer, home-built in the Milwaukee shops, that is. Guys in the Milwaukee shops during this period could seemingly build anything from locomotives to freight passenger cars, to anything you can imagine. Here is a Baldwin AS616. That's the, that's the model number. It's obviously number 561. It's in St. Paul. We don't have a, a date. And it's an uncredited picture. Wabasha, Minnesota. They had a number of these little critters because of some of the uh, uh, branch lines there that had such light rail. And we are in Escanaba. Uh, with a Fairbanks Morse and ore cars. Again, undated and uncredited. I know it's an Owen Leander picture, but I don't know where, but it shows various uh, plows, flangers, ditchers. 
and I have read that the Milwaukee Road would build its own that, that wooden housing or shed on the uh, on the spreader there is is home built. Uh, probably, if I knew more about the Milwaukee Road, I could identify it from the uh, engine house in the background, but I I don't, and I don't see anyone here raising their hand. So. Um, now, two pictures from a, a, a set of slides uh, that uh, was called Milwaukee Road Rolling Stock. And I only chose these two pictures, obviously, downtown Chicago. Uh, the color is still quite vivid, I think. And, uh, uh, but I won't go through the, that entire box because it's basically roster shots of passenger cars. And I know some people get extremely excited by that. and. Uh, uh, they can contact me offline as part of the lots. This is the Milwaukee Road business card. Oh, that, those were Owen Leander shots, by the way. Those, those. The business card, Washington, also an Owen Leander photo. It's in Milwaukee. It's in UP colors. So, um, and based on how the freight cars are, are lettered in the back, I think 1960s. Yes. I've just been informed that that engine house is in Channing, Michigan. And I can only believe the person who says that because I have no basis for disagreeing, but thank you for the information. And our old friend, the Superdome, again in Milwaukee, in the UP colors. So from the 1960s, probably. And uh, those, uh, yeah, that's an only Andrew shot, undated. Here's the sky top, Coon Rapids, um, also an only Andrew shot, also in UP colors, so from the late 50s into the 60s. Um, this, I believe the Coon Rapids ended up being owned by a Madison area rail fan named David Van Ness. And uh, to kind of close this off, uh, Western Avenue in Chicago uh, from the Owen Leander collection. So uh, oh, you may or may not have taken the picture. Yep, that is the world's largest Dixie cup there on top of the building. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you can still get golden loaf bread or not. Western Avenue. Now, uh, a series of photos that uh, kind of an unusual thing for Rod. These aren't color dupes. These are official Milwaukee Road black and white pictures. They're undated, uh, but again, a very dramatic shot. Uh, the uh, number three to the far left is, of course, the 442, part of the four Hiawatha locomotives. Similar looking locomotive to the far right, I think, is the Milwaukee Road's home modified uh, older steam locomotive that's been covered with sheet metal to resemble uh, the, the uh, initial Hiawatha locomotives. Uh, the Number four, one of the four uh, Hiawatha 442s is on display and rail fans are gathering to take a look at it. Look at the tender. There's a rail fan up there standing on top of the tender with his camera, uh, taking a shot of the uh, pop valves going off. Um, another crowd of uh, people inspecting the then brand new uh, Hiawatha train. 1934, so I assume these pictures are 1934. Now, so you, you got this beautiful Hiawatha and you got older steam locomotives and you want them to look like that. How do you go about doing it? Well, here's a sequence of pictures that'll show you how. You put the air tanks on top because you're gonna be building a shroud over that. And the shroud is as tall as the stack. So you add a little sheet music, to, a sheet music, sheet to metal. Uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, bare bones of the uh, of the framing. Uh, this shows how the uh, hidden coupler and the bell both have their own doors, and the smoke box is easily accessible as it should be. Now the uh, paint has been added. Here's the back head, and there you have it, a Hiawatha lookalike, but it's actually an aged four six zero. And the Milwaukee shops could do that kind of work. Here's the interior of the original beaver tail um, observation car on the 1934 Hiawatha. And when you talk about the skills of the Milwaukee Road shopmen, they 
they weren't just metal workers. They knew carpeting, upholstery, finished carpentry, uh, painting, varnishing, uh, and uh, just a bewildering uh, number of skills. Uh, of course, all gone now. Why there were pillows on the floor, I don't know. And the shop crews also created this parade version of the Hiawatha locomotive. If you look closely, you can see the differential on the rear wheel and a sort of little round window um, on the locomotive shrouding, which probably enabled the driver, whoever he was, to actually know what he was doing during the parade. And of course, that's lost and going to. That'd be kind of a neat thing. Even if we didn't have the original preserved, that would be a neat thing to have had preserved. Uh, so uh, this guy is telling me to get going because I'm running out of time. Now we're going to, uh, that's an Owen Leander collection picture, by the way. Now the Chicago Northwestern, we, uh, we return to Rod's shot, which I already described to you. This is a former KD locomotive. They're the ones who had EMD do the uh, conversion to their ball. This sequence of pictures is by Tim Iverson, name not familiar to me, but it shows E6s on the 400. And I think this might be at Bay Street in Milwaukee. It's going east and there it goes. Both Tim Iverson shots. Unfortunately, uh, not dated. Here's Russ Porter's shot showing the Milwaukee Depot with a streamlined Northwestern steam locomotive. And Russ Porter shots taken at night at the Milwaukee Depot. This is an Owen Leander portrait of an E7 leading a passenger train at the, uh, at the Milwaukee Depot. Very clear detail on the tower on this shot. For Duke, this is amazingly clear. Usually you lose something. And Owen walked a little closer to the motive, and you can see that it's got another PO uh, on the front. So I think this is probably, uh, this might be a Green Bay trip. Now, uh, north of the depot and heading south, heading the railroad east, but south towards the depot, uh, this is uh, a, uh, I believe this is a little shot. The building to the left of the tower on the depot is the old Elks. Same locomotive, but uh, obviously, uh, unless that snow melted really quickly, uh, a different day. You can see the gas company uh, above the shed. This is a picture taken at Wiscona. And maybe the most interesting thing about this picture is that the guy on, this, on that signal is huge. I mean, Huge. <laughs> um, and in a typical rail fan posture, you know, you just climb on, the, climb on the property. Now we are at National Avenue, also known as Alice. And you might remember I had a Do You Know article about Alice uh, a couple of years ago now. This is an eastbound Northwestern passenger train. Um, this is an Earl Ruland uh, photo in the Larry Sukup collection. We're at Rochester, so I assume this is the Rochester 400, and it's an Owen Leander shot. Uh, based on the cars, uh, early 50s. And um, there was an entire box of Chicago Northwestern steam locomotives, which I found extremely interesting, but uh, in the interest of time, we'll just look at a couple. Class D Atlantic, uh, fully equipped, I think, for commuter service because uh, you can see uh, uh, extra attachments to the uh, generator. And the, the class E4464. Uh, let's see, we have a, this is a, oh, the, 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 the class D Atlantic, the prior picture, that's a Jake Schmidt. Photo. Any relation? No, no relation, says Keith. In, in the Owen Leander collection, and this is also a Jake Schmidt shot, also from the Owen Leander collection. As I would assume this has got to be either Chicago or Council Bluffs. These didn't come up to Milwaukee. 
And they've all managed to open their front covers to the front covers. So I don't know why the Milwaukee Road guys had so much problem. Um, this is Elroy, and it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a rust border shot, undated, four six two, in Elroy. This could also be uh, an RHS excursion, and uh, SD nine seventeen oh seven, Devil's Lake. Uh, I believe this is unquestionably an NRHS excursion. And I used to know the date of that excursion. It was not on the slide, but I, I've seen it referred to in, in other photo collections. Beautiful fall day. Now two pictures showing the Gaylord Nelson Bronson La Follette uh, campaign special in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. These are Russ Porter shots. I'm old enough to remember Gaylord Nelson and Bronson La Follette, but maybe others either aren't or would prefer not to be. And uh, you can see the, uh, the, the bunting on the front of the locomotive has uh, kind of been torn up by uh, the speed of the train. But there's, I believe that is Gaylord Nelson uh, answering a pointed question from someone in the crowd. And so uh, you can see the band members off to the left and the uh, a truly massive uh, audience uh, to the right. So the uh, Gaylord Nelson won. I no longer call it Bronson La Follette uh, won this election or not. He ran for various things, including governor and attorney general. So now a collection called Sue Line Steam. Uh, I already showed this picture in uh, in uh, a Do You Know column uh, about the X90. This was for a uh, a time when this was this and Old Smoky were the only steam locomotives you could see in uh, in Milwaukee, and this is a very old locomotive dating back to the early 1900s. It's now preserved and in a, a little park setting up in um, uh, I want to say Maquanago, but it's not Maquanago. Up where the other car ferry is, uh, Manitowoc, Manitowoc. There. So uh, this is uh, X90, and it's a Russ Porter shot on Jones Island. Um, the the standard Sioux line switcher for Waukesha was almost always a 280 in the later days of steam, and that's exactly what we're looking at here. This is uh, undated, uncredited. Here we see at cutoff in Milwaukee, which of course is a Milwaukee Road location, but the Sioux line entered Milwaukee via that connection at, uh, at Rugby Junction, and this is one of their, I think, 484s. The tender with its back to us uh, is probably a Milwaukee Road S3. It's 1959, and we're in Ashland, Wisconsin. And Russ Porter had this picture in his collection. Uh, steam has not been on the Sioux line for several years, but this locomotive was not meant to pull cars anymore. Uh, notice the cylinders, <laughs> uh, the cylinder heads are gone. Rather, the boiler is being used with all those uh, uh, hoses to keep the ore uh, from freezing before it's unloaded on the ore dock there. They, they preserved this uh, until 1959, but I think eventually it was scrapped, which is too bad because it, it looks like it's in pretty decent shape. Here's a Sioux Line 282. We are in Minneapolis and it's May 6th, 1956, which is from the Russ Porter collection. This, I think, I think that's after the supposed last date of Sioux Line steam, but the Sioux Line probably had more last dates of steam than any other railroad I know. So it, it could still have been in running order and every once in a while used. We are in Waukesha. It is September 6th. September 6th, 1954, the Rust Porter collection but again, I think I've seen this picture credited for us. So the train is at the depot and the train is gone. Pretty, pretty decent uh, clarity to this picture. Maybe the color isn't exactly on point, but good clarity. And we are in uh, uh, on a set of uh, Green Bay and Western photos. So you notice the guys in the suits are staring at the diesel locomotive. Is the diesel new? No, it's been on the property since 1938, but it's about 10 years later. So maybe 1948, maybe 47, maybe 49. 
They painted it in the new red and gray colors to match the brand new Elko FA diesels that the Green Bay and Western had just gotten. So everyone is admiring the spiffy new appearance of this uh, uh, classic um, Fairbanks Morris HH, or me, Elko HH600. And uh, it's, of course, the photographer was also interested in this little 260. And this was one of the Green Bay and Westerns rather spiffy looking uh, 282s. Now from a collection called New York Central Diesels. I no longer recall why I bought a collection of slides called New York Central Diesels. But Rod could be very persuasive and he could also get a very hurt look on his face if I passed his table without buying something. So I bought a collection of New York Central Diesels. We will not um, spend much time on them, but I think all of these pictures are in Chicago. It would be rare to otherwise know where you decide to see a New York Central engine right next to a Penzi. These are some of the clearest photos uh, that I've seen um, of New York Central. And you can see the various paint schemes from the lightning stripes to the so-called cigar band. Uh, that's lightning stripe there. That's the cigar band uh, scheme for the New York Central. A couple of F units uh, and a green, uh, jade green caboose and one in each paint scheme. And a Fairbanks Morris. Now we're going to move on. We're getting close to the end. I know everyone's uh, getting a little tired of this. We've seen this shot before, the Lou Martin shot uh, near Belton Junction. Actually, it's also near West Junction on the Milwaukee Electric. Uh, today, the freeway would would obscure this view, but we're standing on northwestern tracks. And if we were, if the freeway was there, the Lincoln Avenue off ramp would be just a little bit to our right. The Greenfield Avenue uh, off ramp would be. Uh, uh, more left. Um, and again, the Madison Division line is not visible. I, I can see one rail, but I'm not going to bother trying to tell you where it is. But look at this picture and get a feel for how big this interurban car is. It's almost built to steam locomotive, steam railroad, I should say, standards. That, by the way, is a, uh, a Lou Martin shot, undated. Now here's the same place, same bridge, but this is the pre-war paint scheme for the Milwaukee Electrics. So I can only assume that Lou Martin took this shot uh, in the very early 1940s. Again, notice the heavy duty construction of this uh, car. I mentioned this for a reason. The next picture is taken, and this is also a Lou Martin shot, this is taken and the bridge that went over the Milwaukee Road and the river, rapid transit bridge. And this is speed rail. The operator that came after the Milwaukee Electric, they ran Milwaukee Electric cars, but they also got these, I think from Cincinnati. And notice that it's, this is almost more like light rail. It's almost more like a streetcar uh, than what you're seeing here. And the reason why this is significant is when you look at this picture, we are a few hundred yards away from the greatest disaster, the greatest tragedy in the history of rail fanning in America, the head-on collision between a speed rail, very lightweight car, and one of these heavyweight Milwaukee electric cars as part of the 1950 model, um, NMRA, National Model Railroad Association conventions in Milwaukee. Um, the operator of the speed rail car was actually the guy who owned the railroad. And he was so pestered by questions that apparently he may have run past a red signal. And they had no chance to stop. And, and that heavyweight car just went right through this lightweight, killing 10 and badly injuring 40. Some of the uh, Model Railroading's most famous names were amongst those killed, and even a, a guy on the staff of Model Railroader magazine was amongst those killed. That was the risk of running mismatched, um, mismatched 
cars because the anti-climbers that are at the front of the cars are only good if the car you hit is the same height, and they clearly weren't, nor the same weight, nor the same strength of construction. And that took place pretty close to where National Avenue would be now. On a more happy note, uh, these are all Lou Martin shots. Here we are uh, at the so-called West Junction, not too far from those other pictures with M14 hauling either a pickle car or a vinegar car. So it's a freight motor. We've been here, NRHS has been here. Does it look familiar? A Lou Martin shot. This is the M15 at the Lake Beulah station on the East Troy line. So we've been here. Another shot uh, at East Troy taken by Lou Martin. The D13, I think this is a dump car, a, a, a ballast dump, electric. L1 at the Cold Spring shops, shops, another Lou Martin shot. Now, this one was labeled, it's a Lou Martin picture that was labeled Plankerton Avenue and Wisconsin Avenue. But I think this is Plankerton Avenue and Michigan Avenue because I remember those stores, the walkover shop and the hosiery, whatever it is. And I think that's on Michigan. But in any event, the, the, the photographer is immediately above another trolley car photographing the sizable crowds uh, either waiting for or getting on that other trolley car. That's how important, that's the kind of crowds that rode public transit in Milwaukee at the time. And it's obviously a wintertime shot. This picture was uh, it, reproduced at the back page of the most recent Sparks and Cinders. This is... Uh, a Lou Martin shot of Water Street and Seaboth Avenue Street. Now we shift from Lou Martin shots to Bob Gibson shots. Bob Gibson took this shot of the Lakeside Power Plant shuttle. This that rope it, it ran between the uh, the power plant and the Kinnikinnick Avenue, and it was for employees only. This is a older shuttle than the one that I pictured in my um, Do You Know article in Sparks and Cinders on the Lakeside Power Plant and its shuttle, the last remaining streetcar in Milwaukee running into the 1960s. And again, it was for employees only and the shop and the Lakeside Power Plant's security guard was the operator. Um, but it, it, if he was uh, maybe given a donut uh, on, uh, on donut day, he sometimes allowed rail fans to ride with the understanding that they might have to walk back to their car. Here are the Kinnikinnick Avenue uh, car shops of the uh, Milwaukee Electric Railway and Light Company. And if you look in the far right, you can see the old Allen Bradley clock face. And again, these are Bob Gibson shots. So here we are at Cass in Michigan. Um, notes the yellow stop sign and the, the large building uh, ahead of you is the Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company headquarters, where I labored for 36 years. I never took the trolley car to work. I'm not that old. Now we are on Water Street. Um, notice uh, that that uh, fur coat manufacturing plant that was uh, in the background of this picture, right in the middle of the picture, is uh, in this picture. So we're on Water Street. Uh, we seem to be heading south on Water Street. Note that the car is marked special. I think this was another NRHS fan trip. And you'll see probably nearing the end of its ride, and you'll see other photos that I think are from that trip. So again, this is uh, Gibson photography. Well, give me a moment here to once again catch up to my notes. Now we are Third and Wells. Uh, this streetcar is heading east. Third and Wells, this streetcar is heading west. The building in the background is the old radio doctor's store, which some of you might recall. And notice that there's a pawn shop, second floor. The famous or infamous Well Street Viaduct with Miller Brewery standing next to it. And uh, uh, this picture 
is Bob Gibson. Here is the entire viaduct in a wintertime shot, also taken by Bob Gibson. That was quite a piece of construction. And I'm told that people who rode the trolley car, the number 10 car over the Wells Street Viaduct, usually if they were smart, they would look straight ahead and not out the window or down because uh, um, it, uh, it moved, uh, the bridge kind of moved under the car. So now we're on the west end of that viaduct and notice the sign, it says, uh, danger, viaduct for streetcars only. And then with an, a helpful arrow telling you where you driving your car should go. Well, a predictable number of drunks ended up driving their car right across the viaduct, but usually what happened is about halfway over, the ties would tear their tires to shreds and they'd come to a halt and someone would have to do something about it. It was uh, not unknown. Uh, we are at Wells and 37th Street. Uh, and I think this might be the NRHS special, the Wells and 37th Street Loop. Um, here we are at 68th Street. Note the old right of way um, in the upper left of the picture together with the electric line. The, the freeway has really uh, obliterated much of what we see here and totally changed it. Um, but you can still see some of those uh, abutments as you drive along the freeway uh, in the areas of between 60 and 60. Now, we're, now we're still uh, with Bob Gibson shots here. Now we are at 69th Street. The car to the right, the uh, car sign says Northwestern Depot. And uh, the car to the left says special, which I think again is one of those NRHS uh, rail fan events. 70th Street at the old Alice Chalmers plant. This was a one big reason why this streetcar in mind was kept in, in, in business long after other streetcars were taken down in Milwaukee. This was a major source of traffic. And here we have two cars marked special. Again, at the Alice Chalmers, and you see a guy in a suit there, the Alice Chalmers uh, uh, factory, and we are at 72nd and Greenfield. Again, Bob Gibson, 70th and Greenfield, yes. Uh, and uh, both cars say special. So now we are in Wauwatosa and uh, 72nd and State. That's where I got that 72nd. And the, there are three cars, all marked special, all with guys in suits with cameras. Well, at least some of them are in suits with cameras. And that is the Olympian Hiawatha speeding by. And everyone apparently has gotten their shots because the cameras are down. But uh, some of them are getting the final shot of the sky top on this, what I assume, I believe is an NRHS outing, but it could also have been a CERA, a Central Electric Railroad Association outing. And I don't see any familiar faces. Uh, and of course, I would have known them 40 years later, so I wouldn't recognize them anyway. Um, an interesting sequence of photos. That's the kind of thing the NRHS certainly was known for doing back then. Now, a, a collection that I'm going to call North Shore, and we're, we're reaching the end, but I'm lying because this is actually, of course, South Shore, but it's an uncredited, undated shot. But Rod put it in so he could call the box North Shore and South Shore, so I fell for it. Anyway, here we are on 6th Street. We are looking at the Schrader Hotel. We are looking at the old uh, fence along 6th Street, and this is a um, eastbound or southbound electro liner. Uh, this is a Bob Gibson shot, uh, which I assume to be in the 1940s. Now, the very next shot, Russ Porter's shot of a northbound electroliner, also on 6th Street. But notice that the, uh, that the, uh, the fence along the road is different and the electric, uh, the, the uh, 
Light fixtures on 6th Street look a little different. This picture was taken in January of 1963. The end is near. You're days away from the closure and abandonment of the North Shore. So this is another rail fan outing. Is it NRHS? Is it CERA? I don't know, but it appears they've taken the Milwaukee Electric out so they can get shots in open country of the Electroliner. The one place that I can think of that this might be is near what was called South Junction, which is basically at Ryan Road. Pardon me? Uh, Ryan, near Ryan Road, where the uh, Milwaukee Electric and the North Shore basically ran right next to each other. And I would certainly date this either to the late 50s or early 19, 1949. You know this uh, excursion? Were you there? Yeah. Some, someone in the audience here uh, knows the date, knows of the excursion. So this is 1949. That's about what I would have placed it at um, based on the continuing operation of a Milwaukee electric on that line. So the Milwaukee Electric was running on North Shore tracks. Okay, so this need not. So this probably is therefore not at Ryan Road. But uh, well, I don't know because if there was a junction between the two there at South Junction. So this still might be near South Junction. Here is a uh, picture in Racine, January of 1963, Russ Porter. The silver liner to the left, and the electro liner to the right. Here is, uh, let's see, the curve near College Avenue, 19, June 1961, a Russ Porter shot. There's the Heil Company in the background, which tells me that this is a northbound electro liner. Heading over the bridge there. This is 6th and Oklahoma, and the picture was taken in 1962 by Russ Porter. Here's Russ Porter's shot of the curve that goes from 5th Street, 6th Street to 5th Street in January of 63. So once again, the end is near. Remember, it took 6th Street out of downtown and then switched over to 5th Street. Here we are at the North Shore Depot in Milwaukee, and um, the Electroliner is in the depot. It's a Russ Porter shot from 1958. That picture, the, the tall building in the background is known by various names over the years, but it, it was primarily known as the Mariner Tower. I'm not sure exactly why that's true. My father's law office is near the top of that building and he could look right down 6th Street. By the time I thought to Maybe he moved his offices there after the North Shore, because I certainly never saw a North Shore train from those windows. It was a, a, a great view. It would have been a perfect, what if I'd had a camera on a telephoto lens at age uh, seven, I, I could have gotten a wonderful picture. Um, we are, this is a Bob Gibson shot at Glencoe, Illinois. Also a Bob Gibson shot at 22nd Street in North Chicago, undated. Here we are at Great Lakes Naval Base. And I believe this is a northbound, so Milwaukee bound uh, a North Shore train. Uh, but uh, the guys, the sailors on leave would either go to Chicago or Milwaukee. And I'm told, that the North Shore crews uh, named these trains <clears throat> for reasons that should occur to you uh, as the Penicillin Express. Bob Gibson again at a place called Howard, but it's not Howard Avenue because note the uh, line poles are down and there's third rail. Uh, so this is approaching Chicago. Now, reversing, here is Russ Porter showing the curve from 6th Street to 5th Street, January 1963. So again, the end is near, note the old bus in the background. This is an exciting shot, I think. 
uh, this is uh, uh, this is in the loop. Uh, it's a Russ Porter shot taken in 19. Pardon me. It's a Russ Porter shot taken in June of 1962, and the uh, electroliner is running on third rail, so the poles are down. What a urban canyon! One of the peculiarities of the North Shore was that to get the permission to build their depot in downtown Milwaukee, they had to agree to run a streetcar service down to the south side and to run it at a grand price of five cents a ride. Uh, so they swallowed hard and did, did that. So here's this, you know, the North Shore streetcar um, running alongside the Chase Avenue roundhouse of the Chicago Northwestern, now obviously totally gone. Um, What's less well known is that Waukegan made the same demands of the North Shore. So here is um, the uh, Russ Porter. Pardon me. I need to need, need to make sure I'm getting this correct here. Uncredited. This is uh, North Shore's uh, streetcar in Waukegan, but in a much earlier era. Um, judging on by the, uh, the look of the streetcar and by the photo of the automobiles parked on the road. I can recommend a uh, Burgoff beer if you ever uh, have a chance to drink it. Um, North Shore had some huge freight locomotives, but they didn't uh, buy them new. They were bought used from the Oregon Electric. So this is uh, one of those locomotives. And uh, it's a, a Bob Gibson shot. This is essentially the same locomotive, just with different sheet metal, but it's also an Oregon Electric original that's now North Shore. Um, quite a quite a hulking locomotive, and again uh, another Bob Gibson shot. And uh, here we are at South Upton, showing one of those former Oregon Electrics with a uh, uh, a short train to all of hopper cars. Russ Porter took this shot in uh, June of 1962 of the. Uh, Depot platform in the Milwaukee Depot, North Shore Depot. I think it's a very atmospheric picture. There's just something about the gleam of the sun on the, on the riveted car sides, the old wooden platform. Um, it, uh, it's just an era gone by that is lost and gone forever, alas. And it's fitting that it was Russ Porter who took the shot of the destruction of the North Shore's Depot. Uh, a year and a half after the last train uh, was run, July of uh, 1964. Now, that should be the way this program ends. I mean, you've destroyed the railroad, you've destroyed the depot, I should say goodnight. But instead, oh, look, one thing about this picture I forgot. Notice that the words North Shore Depot were printed on glass uh, on the far side of the depot and they're backlit. So you can actually read them backwards about the, uh, the shovel during the, the destruction. But the North Shore had a car storage area. Um, and just to get a feel for Milwaukee geography, for those who might be a little uh, uncertain about it, it wasn't all that far from the Milwaukee Road Depot. You could see the Milwaukee Road Tower on the depot in the background of this shot of the car storage area. And this is uh, uh, a... Uh, Seemingly an uncredited picture, but it's basically not far away from this unusual shot of uh, the Leander collection, 1954, looking at the depot right through the train shed. Um, and but notice this is with the uh, the top of the uh, tower removed again because people thought it made Milwaukee look dowdy and old fashioned. So it all comes back full circle from all those railroads that, uh, that Rod Robinson would champion with his slide sets. It comes back to his beloved Milwaukee Road. And with that, I'm going to say thank you for your kind attention. So this is our last, uh, last event of the semester, if you will, the 2022-2023 the the, the semester. So uh, take your books and go home. Um, but 
uh, talking about next season, as I've done before, we are always looking for uh, people to give a presentation. People here in this uh, room are invited to contact me. My contact information is in Sparks and Cinders, and, and therefore it's also on our website. Uh, the people on Zoom are invited to contact me about giving a presentation. And should this portion of my talk uh, survive into the uh, YouTube uh, uh, recording, I would invite our YouTube viewers to contact me with our uh, contact information on our Wisconsin chapter on our HS website to give a presentation to us next season. Uh, we'd love to see what you have to offer. Thanks again. Good night. Thank you, Dave. Uh, they kind of pretty much wrapped everything up. So, again, uh, watch for a special panel about um, East Troy and watch also more information about the banquet. Uh, those will be coming up soon. So, uh, please uh, keep an eye out for those. We will do email and uh, snail mail for those that uh, aren't as tech savvy. So, don't worry about that. So, please consider those. Uh, we'll start September, but the uh, favorite uh, photo night where you uh, can put together some photos from the summer or summers ago, or well, I can't say summers to come because that hasn't happened yet. So let's not do that one. Uh, so, but uh, that wouldn't work well. So, but uh, that'll be the first one. And then October will be the banquet. And uh, then we'll, uh, we'll go from there.